Well, they're all a very friendly bunch. You have a knack for making friends. If you love listening to this show, please consider giving a rating and a review on Amazon Alexa or wherever you listen. We want to continue bringing you this amazing content, and part of our ability to do that means that we need a big audience. Now, it may not seem like much, but rating and reviewing the show will help more people find us, just like how you found this show. Simply on any podcast platform, search for our show, scroll down to the bottom, and push five stars. It's that easy. Thanks for supporting the show. Today, I'm joined by Dr. Maha Ahor, who is the CEO and CTO of MetalWave Corporation. It's a startup that's focused on high-performance radar for highly automated vehicles and MM Wave 5G solutions. Welcome to the show today. Pleasure to meet you. So Maha, my understanding is that um, the work that you're doing really originated from some of the, uh, I guess, the incubation work that you guys were doing at Park, which is part of the Xerox company. Uh, Can you tell us about that experience and how you've grown that into its its current form today? Sure, absolutely. So uh, I was a consultant at Park before starting MetaWave, working uh, with their MetaMaterial team on their demonstration at 2.4 gigahertz. And of course, during that time, the excitement about autonomous driving, the excitement about removing the driver uh, from the Ubers and Lyfts uh, was at the peak with the billions of dollars invested in cameras and LIDARs. So investors came to Park and asked if we can take that technology and implement it in a millimeter wave radar for automotive application. Because that specific technology focused the beam, steered the beam. That means it enables radars to get closer to the LiDAR capabilities uh, without the increased cost, power consumption, and size, and so forth. So that's kind of the jumpstart of MetaWave uh, when I founded it in 2017. But as you know, when you build a product, uh, it's not driven by the underlying technology. It's driven by its capability and the way how it meets market needs in terms of pricing and power consumption and performance. So we transitioned since then using our own technology. So MetaWave developed its own technology since then, and we've been using that. So it's nice to have Park give us this jumpstart, but uh, the technologies that we have developed for our radar today is fully based on our patents. Um, We filed over 200 patents with the first six being allowed and issued. That's terrific, thank you very much. And I think that's a great transition to talk about what MetaWave does today. Uh, specifically targeting the automotive industry with the sensing needs. Now, can you talk about uh, some of the core IP in terms of the beam steering radar for autonomous driving? And how is it actually supporting some of the 3D imaging as well as the vehicle-to-vehicle communication um, so that regardless of the, the weather conditions um, that uh, you know, you're providing these operating scenarios um, using the ADS sensor fusion um, to get a good sense of the, the surroundings? Absolutely. So um, most of the radars today, including the radars that you have in, uh, in your cars, they rely on the digital signal processing algorithms. It's because it's always easy to manipulate zeros and ones. And all our competitors today are, are using uh, similar approaches to address the needs for the long range accuracy resolution uh, for the radar. But the reality is the physics uh, at this higher frequency prohibits MIMO or these advanced digital processing from meeting these long range capability. And this is why MetaWave at sea as this year was the first radar company to demonstrate uh, you know, object detection at 350 meters very clearly with a good field of view and also pedestrian detection at 250 meters, something that nobody else could do. And the only way you could do it is when you focus the beam because when you focus the beam, you have higher signal 
that is uh, reflected by this object. And then hence you are able to, to detect them at long range. So that was our first demonstration, the 3D radar that detects the range, velocity, and the location of that object in the horizontal plane. Now, I'm very happy to also say that we are uh, at the same time building the brain that resides in the radar to provide a real-time labeling of the object. So now the radar can know if that object in front of them is a motorcycle or it's a bicycle or it's a pedestrian. And we train our radar with the other sensor, with LIDARs and cameras to create that intelligence. Once we create this intelligence, we don't need these other sensors. So it becomes a completely self and independent edge sensor that provides these 4D capabilities. The fifth dimension that we will demonstrate next year involves the vertical uh, you know, detections. That means now you can separate the bridges or look at the height of a truck or an SUV and, and, and further enhance the perception capabilities of these radars. So um, it's very nice that we started with the analog beam steering using our own technologies. And at the same time, uh, now we are going back and balancing the complexity with the digital algorithms to make sure we deliver the smallest footprint, the lowest power consumption and the highest performance to the edge customers. So the hybrid analog digital is our success recipe? Yeah, I think um, I think you really uh, laid it laid it out uh, very well in terms of kind of the you know where the origination was as well as where things are going. Um, I wanted to just kind of spend a little bit of time on on the original kind of the baseline of the analog. Uh, for those that are not as familiar, maybe you could talk a little bit about the difference between the lidar camera digital beamforming, which you started to talk a little bit about, and the difference of W-band advanced radar long-range optic recognition that you're referring to, that's able to have that perception up to, say, 300 meters, regardless of any weather conditions that maybe some of these other approaches have uh, difficulties being able to ascertain. And then separately, after that, we can talk about uh, this layering of the digital component for labeling and machine learning capabilities, and then the vertical capability that you're talking about in terms of enhanced metadata of the objects themselves. Yeah, absolutely. So as you know, cameras and LIDAR, they operate at optical frequencies where the wavelength is very short. And I always like to give an analogy of a surfer on a wave. If you have a very you know, long wave, that wave actually can go much further down in the ocean compared if you have a very, very short wave, uh, which is similar to the optical frequency. And the same thing for the propagation through atmosphere. When you have a much longer wavelength, you're able to propagate in dense fog, in the ashes that comes from fire, in, in other kind of you know, conditions. Now, when you have a, a camera, for example, the camera is uh, you know, just a, a tool that, that detects the full scene and then it digitizes it into these pixels and analyzes the pixel. So most of the information coming from, from the cameras are based on these pixelization, which is in the digital domain. So it's very difficult for a camera-based ADA system to meet an ASLD requirement, which will enable cars to get to this higher level of autonomy. So that leaves the LiDAR and camera and, and the radars, the only two analog sensors that can meet this higher level of, uh, of, of safety standards. Now, because I mentioned the LiDAR comes with a very short wavelength, it has very you know, high difficulties meeting these long ranges. Um, and the only way that they can do that is they have to illuminate or send more power, laser powers, uh, so they can get this reflection. But at the same time, they have issues with the eye safety as well uh, by uh, you know, sending higher power laser and also the power consumption because most of these lasers have lower efficiency. So these kind of are the prohibitive factors from the LiDAR. And when you see this beautiful, uh, colorful um, mapping, uh, cloud maps that the LiDAR produces, uh, it always stops at maybe 50, 100 meter maximum. And, and we have actually one of the LiDAR, which is the Blackmore LiDAR, that has 300, 400 meter range. Uh, but as soon as you have bad weather, it shrinks down to 50, 100 meters. So, so it is impacted with that. And the other thing I want to point out 
is the resolution. So the resolution is how can you separate objects at these long ranges? You have two objects running in two lanes on a highway. How can the LIDAR or the radar at long ranges distinguish between these objects? And, and today, MetaWave has demonstrated, actually is the only radar today that can separate objects at this uh, 1.2 degree um, you know, resolution at 300 and 350 meter, whereas the LIDAR resolution, as I mentioned, stops at probably 50, 100 meter. Um, so at the end, you will need all the sensors to meet this high level of safety, but eventually, maybe 50 or 100 years from now, people will look back and they said, why did you need a LIDAR? Or, or why did you need a driver? You know, these sensors can, are far superior from any driver, good drivers today. So you can never take the driver as a benchmark, but what you have to take into consideration is meeting the level of safety with the best uh, you know, numbers of uh, false positives and false negatives. So you can uh, you know, avoid all these kind of uh, accidents in, in the future. Now, the fourth dimension, which is the elevation is, is required and the LIDARs and the cameras do deliver that. Radar, some of the radars today are delivering some of elevation capability, but still at a much shorter range. Why the elevation is, is critical is because as you go into an underpass or as the, the cars going into tunnels and so forth, uh, the car needs to fully understand the perception of, of its surrounding. Now, the, the AI is, uh, I call it always icing on the cake because at 300 meters, if you have good perception, you can reduce the complexity in the, your ADA suite. So now your cameras and LIDARs, they don't have to scan the full scenes in order to detect objects and track them, but uh, focus on the regions of interest defined by our radar at these long ranges. So that will save power, it will save time, and it will also save lives. Yeah, I think uh, one of the things that's very important for probably the listeners to understand is that it's not a, a one shot uh, I mean, for all solutions, but rather it's this notion of optimizing what each of these various different approaches is best suited for. And it's actually working in conjunction with that. And just to help the, the listeners uh, kind of put this in a more kind of lay person context is that, you know, if you think about London or more of the kind of the suburbs of London, let's say in the UK, Many times there are significant pileups because there, there's heavy fog and, and fog, we, we kind of lose our sense of perception in terms of death and we tend to speed and go at a much higher rate. And of course, it results in pileups and, and significant accidents and injuries. That's the kind of, you know, potential, um, you know, prevention and mitigation that we're talking about. Um, and, then, and then certainly, I think uh, one of the things that's really interesting is that when we think about it in the context of electric vehicles, as an example, where the overall power consumption becomes very important and every wattage use is really critical, uh, these autonomous vehicle components that you know really that becomes the sensors are really computation, but also energy intensive. So being able to be frugal and efficient with the energy use and power use becomes very, very important to what you're talking about, as well as the allocation of resource and load to the things that's best suited for that you're talking about in terms of LIDAR versus, uh, let's say, an analog approach. Uh, I want to transition to talk about uh, some of the specifics around the MM wave spectrum and why um, it has been somewhat of a kind of a you know poor medium in terms of you know poor channel propagation, losses in terms of due, uh, due to atmospheric absorption, higher path losses at higher frequencies and augmented by losses through glass. Um, can you talk a little bit about that and how your approach to the analog antenna is uh, addressing some of these issues? Yes, so millimeter wave channel is fundamentally different from sub six. And I think the mistake that the community was based on the evolution decade ago was taking the technology they developed of sub six and assuming it would work well at, at this high frequency. The reality is you just cannot create these femto cells and you have higher number of radios everywhere. Not only the cost, the power consumption, but also the consumer concern seeing all this radio around them. So what we have developed is a smart mirror and the smart mirror looks like a picture frame. You can uh, print any kind of uh, design on it or you can completely camouflage it with the background. 
And the role of these um, smart mirror is to bend the signals uh, and while bending the signals, they focusing it in the elevation plane when you still have good coverage in the azimuth. This way you can bring a signal inside a conference room from a radio in the lobby or take a signal around the corner in these uh, long corridors in buildings or connect with the backhaul for G node Bs outside uh, that have very poor connection uh, to the backhaul uh, connectivity. So um, we were approached by NTT Docomo, I can share this because they had a press release about that in 2018, because we were doing metamaterial and they asked if we can uh, extrapolate that technology for the uh, 5G applications. So again, MetaWave developed its own technology we call it metastructures. And so far we are the only company who have successfully uh, demonstrated this capability in Japan and also in the US and very soon in other parts of the country and uh, of, of the world. Uh, so, uh, you know, bringing these beautiful passive mirrors now into the network brings a challenge because the carriers are not used to that. They're used to a single SKU radio that they just install it and manage it remotely. These that are, cannot be managed. They have, don't have wire, they have zero delay, the lowest cost solution, but they deliver 30 to 40 dB gain, which is unheard of today. Uh, as, you know, a, a, a completely passive solution that give you 30 or 40 dB gain. Uh, and on the other side, uh, we also are building an active version of this solution, we call it uh, the turbo repeater. And, and that one has a much higher amplification, but it's still, operates in the analog domain. So it has a two nanosecond delay. It has the lowest cost compared to other radio. And it can bring the signal indoor through glass. It can extend the range by another 200 meter uh, without you know, bearing on the additional cost of, uh, of installing another radio. And I think this is, has been one of the biggest challenge in rolling out millimeter wave globally uh, is the carriers just cannot put a G node B or a 5G new radio every hundred meter uh, during installation. So that we're very proud to be uh, very innovative in that space and trying to solve the problem by bringing down the cost, decreasing the delay, and at the same time, reducing the power consumption. Yeah, this is a really, really fascinating buzz. Um, you know, I think for those that uh, have been tracking 5G for some time is that it's a very CapEx intensive uh, rollout and implementation for them to properly have the true 5G claims that they have in terms of coverage and, 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 and the kind of bandwidth and no latency. It really requires a, just a whole new infrastructure. And of course, these antennas are incredibly power hungry uh, to you know, support the right amplification. And what you're providing is something that's passive, it's analog. Uh, really doesn't consume, you know, really hardly any any electricity, maybe except the, the active one. But it, it's really taking advantage of it and also, you know, providing this uh, kind of unusual use cases, like you mentioned, the, the corners and the edge, the back end, uh, things that are, are typically difficult to get full coverage around. So that, that to me really is very, very interesting. I, I'm, I'm kind of curious as to how you guys are uh, being positioned in terms of the overall 5G ecosystem and how are the telcos looking to you to support some of the, the rollouts? So we started by talking to the telcos because we believe that adding these products into their offering will further um, you know, increase the rollout of the customers. The reality is the telco, you know, the, I'm sorry, talking about the radio vendors. Let's start with the radio vendors first. But the radio vendors at that time, they were very busy building their own product. So we went directly to the telcos. So today we work directly with the carriers both in Japan, in the US, and other parts of the country, of, of the globe. And, and the whole point is when we do these successful trials with them, when we reduce the number of needed radios in an indoor environment by half, they get very excited. And then they refer us to their suppliers, the companies that they do the network planning, that they do the installation. And next week, we're going to have a press release uh, about... Uh, an agreement with one of these suppliers in Japan uh, where we have completed this kind of uh, you know, process regarding training them on these uh, passive reflectors and how to use them and start mass producing this product. Uh, 
Um, so it's very nice to start with the telcos, then transition to their suppliers and their providers. But eventually what we really need to do is to work with the radio vendors so they can include these type of products in the product offering uh, in order to uh, avoid the delay in these network rollouts. Yeah. yeah. And, and just to kind of, again, kind of bring it back to our, our original conversation around autonomous vehicles is that, you know, when we think about mobility and connectivity, it's not just simply the cell towers anymore. Of course, you know, we're not talking about satellites just yet, but it's this notion that uh, edge devices such as autonomous vehicles, uh, other other devices, other hubs that can become, you know, 5G hotspots, essentially. Um, that's really what we're talking about, is this kind of a, a distributed grid, a mesh network grid that, that supports and, and, and kind of amplifies the 5G network. Can you talk a little bit about how you envision these autonomous vehicles and EV fleets uh, communicating with the cell towers and some of the operators to have this type of connectivity, especially in an autonomous uh, context with a lot of computation, like I said before, memory needs. And, and at some point, you not only want to just do it locally, there may be some round trip that's needed to the cloud as well for additional computation. How can all the, the pieces that you're working on help facilitate this? Yes, yeah, so um, as you know, today's cars, uh, when you design an ADA suite, it's all closed loop. That means I try to meet all the requirements just within the car. And that mode of operation has to exist uh, for security reason, in case there is a, a security breach that's happening in the V2X communication or V2V communication. But I would probably guess 90% of the operation in urban area is going to happen in the open loop where you have these kind of distributed uh, system uh, to share digital maps, to share uh, you know, knowledge about uh, object and about uh, hazards on the road or, uh, or in surrounding these, uh, these vehicles. So uh, delay is always gonna be extremely critical for this application. And that's why millimeter wave 5G with its less than 10 millisecond delay becomes uh, a viable infrastructure to enable these kind of capability. Um, so we will not see that in my opinion in the next couple of years because it has to be a hybrid millimeter wave and sub six, because if you don't have millimeter wave coverage, you cannot just be completely out of the grid, but you will transition to a lower speed con connectivity. At least you can have some vital information or control mechanism. So just putting security on the side, assuming all these networks are highly secure and so forth. Uh, in my opinion, it's the only way that you can deploy uh, a fleet of autonomous vehicle or consumer uh, AV vehicle, uh, you know, uh, in, um, in reality, and also deploy these 5G networks with these edge compute services. So if 4G was about apps and 3G was about data, 5G is all about services, edge services, especially edge services with low latency. And this is where most of the creative new businesses, the new uh, revenue stream that's going to come both to the carriers and to these additional companies that will provide these services. And AV is one of them. Of course, telehealth is another. Teletraining is another. So you have so many different applications that can run at, at, at the edge. And our to enable this to happen, you have to have a robust infrastructure. So you can start talking about slicing, network slicing, you can talk about all of these you know, amazing um, capabilities that the network can, can do. But if you don't have that connectivity, that robust link that provides you the gigabit speed, the low latency, the low power consumption, it will be almost impossible to meet these kind of milestones. So this is how we start working on the infrastructure side and now that we have also our radar uh, in uh, testing in the car, working directly with the, with the OEMs, we see a lot of discussion. How do we bring that signal inside the car? Mm -hmm. How do you bring the millimeter wave inside the car without requiring convertible? And that's becoming an extremely challenging problem because distributed antennas, active antenna around the car, is something that OEMs are not used to. They only have a shark fin. Uh, but it has to happen to maintain connectivity uh, between the infrastructures and the, and the vehicles. And, and, to, and to that point, I think, um, you know, there's a lot of um, noise and interference. Um, so 
you know, if, if people have experience with certain devices that tr they're trying to install into the car is that there's only a few clear spots um, to play. So, you know, sorting all that out and, and making sure that you have the, the right connectivity inside so that you can actually support uh, in-car entertainment, mobility and productivity and so forth becomes very, very important and challenging. So um, we only have time for one more minute is uh, the last question we always ask is uh, if you could share any type of product or project failure and lessons learned from that. Sure. Well, I think it's I think lessons learned from some of the product uh, trials, and I'll just take an example here uh, for the AV trucks. As you know, long haul delivery is becoming more and more critical uh, during COVID, and we see now more and more focus has been on the AV trucks versus AV uh, AV uh, cars. And uh, something we weren't actually aware of is the rear view of, of these trucks because they have this long metallic trailer. They cannot put any sensor of these trailers. So the question is that cameras cannot see very far, LIDARs cannot see very far, but the AV trucks on highways and freeways they need to see the cutouts, you know, cut in and cut out of the cars coming in different lanes. So, um, it was music to our ears when one of the AV companies, the truck companies came and they said, could we use your radar in that application? For us, it was only the front long range, high resolution radar that's most of the testing has been done this way. So it was really nice to mount it on the side mirrors of the AV truck and clearly enable the car the truck now to see in the back. Great. Well, thank you so much. Today, I'm joined by Dr. Maha Ahor, who is the CEO and CTO of MetalWave Corporation. If you've enjoyed this episode, take a moment to rate our show on any podcast platform that you listen to. Scroll down to the bottom and push five stars. It's that easy. And as always, thanks for listening.